we'll begin in prayer and they may trickle in. Is that going? Yeah, it's going. Okay. Well, I'll open as usual. If somebody will close as usual. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, thank you for bringing us together to study in your word. And uh, Lord, I pray that... Uh, I pray for repentance in our country. I pray to your Heavenly Father for uh, the changes that will be taking place down the road. Uh, Lord, we, even though we may not understand what's going on, we, we do understand, Lord, that you are in control. And we thank you, dear Lord, for reminding us of that through your word. And be with us now as we study in your word in chapter 35 of Genesis, as we learn more about uh, Jacob and uh, Isaac and his family and um, and let, help us to understand how to apply these truths to our life and uh, be with those who couldn't make it this evening and uh, be with those who are still on their way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. We're now getting into the chapter where at the end of it will be the death of Isaac. There's a picture I found there. It's black and white. Like I said, we don't get into color until <coughs> Joseph get the color in the Chapter 35. Did you bring your Bible? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I will begin reading. And we'll go off in the direction of Sydney if she would like to pass on. Just pass it on. I said 35, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 35. Okay, that's not a long one. Okay. Chapter 35. I'll read about, let's see, how many, let's see, there's 29 in here, so, I'll read about, in here somewhere. I'll read till 15, that's a natural break, and then somebody can pick up at 16. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. Now let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto, the, unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is, Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was Alon Bujath. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. In the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake unto him, Bethel. That's verse 16. That was good? Yeah. <laughs> then they journeyed from Bethel, and, went, and when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. It came about while Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. I won't be so mean to make you read all the names. 
<laughs> now there were twelve sons of Jacob, and the sons of Le- the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last, last and died and was gathered to his people, an old man of ripe age, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. You got off the hook. You got off the hook there. <laughs> I glanced down. I thought, oh, that's not nice. <laughs> yeah, the next chapter is even worse. It's uh, Esau and all his descendants. So we might just do a brief glance over 36. All right. Uh, what's interesting here, this is a reminder, of course, in Genesis, back in Genesis 28, verses 10 through 12, Highlighting verse 13, it said, The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed. This, this, of course, is the chapter when Jacob is fleeing from his family, from fleeing from Esau, thought he was going to be away for a few days, just till his brother's temper cooled down a little bit. It was at this location, uh, at Bethel, also which was known as Luz. You made it! You're here! Did you guys start at 6.30 or 7? So we started at 7. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're just we're just running behind. You're just a little bit behind. No big deal. <sighs> we just started. We just finished reading. But if you like, you can read the whole thing again for us. Oh, okay. Just what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> we had a great conversation about the last night's events, but we'll do that later on. Was there an event last night? <laughs> But anyway, uh, like I said, as a reminder, he's back. He's back now, going back to Bethel. But as a reminder, back in 28, when he was leaving his, the family, getting away from Esau, thought he was going to be there for a few days, or in in the land of uh, where Laban is. Uh, he stops here to rest. Again, he makes it not again, but he makes a, a a pillow out of a stone, and that's where he makes his bed. And it's there that night he has the dream where he sees the, the angels descending, going up and down on the on the, what some refer to as Jacob's ladder. But there, it, God had said He's going to give that land to him and his seed, as a reminder. And it says here also when Jacob was there, uh, it says, "And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God." And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So it's at this place at Bethel that he's finally come back to after over 20 years. Uh, it was the place that God said, where you're laying your head, look around, this is where I'm going to give to you and your seed. And of course, Jacob here also makes a vow to him. Uh, from what we can tell, Jacob has not yet given a tenth, at least it's not mentioned in the scriptures. Um, but um, and some more general reminders that came from the Lord. Uh, of course, Jacob, in the previous chapter, he had trouble in the land of Shechem because of his daughter and his sons. If you remember in the previous chapter, uh, they took Dinah uh, by force, raped her. Uh, they made a, a bargain through a lie, saying, all you men be circumcised, and then you can, we can have a trade. Of course, they waited till the second or third day until they were very sore. Yes. The chapter we we're on 35. Thank you. Okay. Yes. okay. Sorry. Yep. We're on 35. I was off by a chapter. I read 34 again this morning. Oh, okay. Yeah. I prepared 34 and 35. I thought 34 would be a quick one last last time, but it was uh, it took up the whole time to do it. So, again, coming from Padan Aram, met Esau along the way. They, they stopped for a little while in Sukkoth to feed the cattle, let them rest. But then they stayed a while in Shechem. And the indication is they may have been there for seven to eight years. Um, and then, of course, finally they're moving up to Bethel. And like, I don't know if I said this last time, but or if it's in here, but where they were in Shechem and where Bethel is, it's only about 30 miles apart. So that's, you know, a couple days journey. So for whatever reason, I don't know, he stayed down in, Sh- in Shechem 
or Shal Shalem, which is the city of Shechem, for 78 years, but it was promised that the Lord would have him come back to this location. So it almost, in a sense, seems possibly he was in a bit of rebellion, not moving on like he should have. I think that's what we talked about last week. Who was all here last week? I can't remember. You and I, of course. And, and Doris. Doris. Doris was here. Okay, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. We, we were talking about this, and I forgot who was here, or who wasn't here. And uh, it seems the message that at least what we pulled out of that chapter was that if you're not abiding in the will of God, you may find yourself getting in trouble. Because God had commanded him to come back home. Of course, if you remember, when he saw Esau along the way and he wrestled with the angel that night, the angels had also told him, you know, keep going, keep going on back. But for some reason, he took seven or eight years down in Shechem. And that's, of course, the time when Dinah was old enough that she was able to leave the house and she was going out. And some believe that she was actually going to a festival in the land. Of course, many of the festivals were were uh, holy festivals, so she was, in a sense, participating with somebody else's holy day. And uh, she ended up getting caught and taken and snatched away and raped. And uh, then the, 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 uh, the son tried to get the father to bargain with Jacob to, to get the girl. Uh, but then, of course, two of, the, two of the sons, along with the others, two of the sons led the revolt, but the others joined in and uh, killed all the men and then stole all, took all the women. So now Jacob was afraid of being in the land because now he, his sons made, in a sense, made him an enemy of all the people in the land. So it was at this time again, now God was calling him finally, come on, I told you to go back to Bethel. I told you this is the place that was the promise. This is, you know, where you saw, you know, all the stuff where I blessed you and I confirmed the covenant. So. We weren't really sure why he waited seven or eight years to finally go up to a place that's only a few miles down the road. I mean, obviously, 30 miles walking is a lot of walking, but compared to where they came from, which was all the way in, you know, up north, uh, taking several months to get home. So anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, and as best as I can tell, Jacob had not yet given a tenth of all that he had possessed like he had vowed. And I put here, the Lord, however, reminded him of his vow by calling him back and setting up an altar. So God said, I'll give you all this land. Jacob says, well, if you're the guy that's going to take care of me, then I'll vow a vow and I'll give you 10%. But so far, the indication is he has not yet given or committed to that, completed that vow, as best as we can tell, or as, I, as best as I can tell. Um, what's interesting here, you know, we're talking about Jacob's life how he's committed to the Lord, but he still has issues going on in his life. There's sin, there's uh, problems with his children. Uh, what's interesting here, it says, Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. Uh, that kind of sounds like, if, if this is a man, it'd almost be like, you know, it's like in our household, it's like, okay, we haven't been to church for a while, so guys, Put away the pentagrams and the voodoo dolls, and and uh, take off your 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 S and M outfits, and let's go to church. Because <laughs> he because he also said change your garments. So apparently they had a lot of pagan <laughs> idols. What does that mean? <laughs> sorry, sorry. What does that mean? I wasn't thinking. That now, was, thanks for opening that question. Yeah, it's pagan ritual garment, okay? That's all this. I don't know what it means. It's pagan ritual. Did I need to Google it? No, no. No, don't Google it. No. <laughs> don't Google it. I was thinking because he said to take off your garments and put on your your, your other garments and so on. Your, your Sunday best. Your Sunday best. Yeah, let's put on your Sunday best. So it, that's kind of maybe not an equivalent, but. <laughs> Sort of the idea, I mean, that's kind of almost hard to think, you know, put away the voodoo dolls and the pentagrams and the, and the, and the uh, what's that book called, the, the Book of Shadows and the Necromonicon, and uh, let's go up and worship the Lord. So here you have, among his household, he's got these foreign gods. Now, I don't know where these gods came from. My, one of my guesses was it's some of the gods that Rachel stole from uh, Laban, his, her, that was her father, yeah stole from her father. Remember when they took the gods and she hit them and he went looking for them and uh, she was actually sitting on them. So uh, 
who knows where they got all this stuff, but I find that so weird that here's a man that's walking with the Lord, but he still has some of this stuff going on in his household. Which makes you stop and ask the question, okay, do we have that stuff going on in our household? I'm not going to have any volunteer or anything, because... Yes, I, I do have a pentagram in the back room. I'm sorry. I, I need to get rid of it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's interesting to see here's a man of God, uh, a man that the Lord spoke to directly in visions. Uh, and, of course, I believe that it was Christ himself who was wrestling with him. But he still has some, some of these struggles going on in his own personal life, uh, which in one sense is a comfort to me to know that as I look at my own life, I'm not completely perfect in, in everything. Uh, I, I, my walk is not as it should be, uh, but I know that the Lord is still with me, and He's still being patient with me. And if you think about that, that's after 20 years, He's still dealing with some of these problems, but God is still with Him. So that's, in a sense, is a comfort to know that when you walk with Christ, it's not an immediate one day you're walking in sin, the next day you're completely perfect and you never touch sin again. Um, it's a journey of change over time. So that's, that was a comfort. Um, as I was studying this, I, I sometimes, like I say, I look through, um, uh, slip my mind, Esword, and one of the one of the commentaries in there is called the Summarized Bible, and uh, it's it points out here, there's no perfect communion with God until all idols are put away, and we come into his presence as he directs. Some of the striking facts, it says, arise and go to Bethel. God is ever calling the soul back to himself. Christ says, remember from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works. And of course, uh, I recently read, there was an article, I'm getting back into the, the election thing, uh, there was an article by Der Spiegel, it's a German magazine. And it had on the front cover, it had uh, Uncle Sam in a hospital bed, laid up, sick, about ready to die. And uh, it's, I guess, the, the person who wrote that article, in response to the election, saw that America is now getting sicker because of the direction we're heading. And uh, what's interesting <clears throat> is even though we are heading in this path, if you look at Israel in their decline, God was continually calling them to come to repentance. God is not a God that will tell you, I'm going to tell you this one time, and then that's it. He's constantly calling you back. Now, the, the scripture does indicate there's a point at which God will, if you're not his, if you're not listening to him, then he gives you over to a reprobate mind. But if you're his, he will continually call you back again and again, reminding you. Kind of shows how, in a sense, how stupid we are. Uh, but it also shows how merciful he is. So, and that's one of the, the this other person I read an article, it was from a, a Christian who lives over in Germany, writing to Americans, saying, don't look at this as a bad thing, look at this as God is using this man as a rod of correction to bring you back into his will. And that actually aligns with scripture. A lot of the bad counsel bad leaders, bad priests, bad prophets that were given to the nation of Israel was for the purpose of being a rod of correction, to get them back in alignment with the Lord. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's comforting to know that God is not a parent, that God doesn't have liberal, liberal values. He just doesn't let you run out there namby-pamby, do whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> he will, uh, he will let you, he will let you kind of wander for a little bit, but then he will correct you, kind of like I've done in times past. Is it like SNL? Drop it. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy made a boo boo. Move on. Like Tim Hawkins, that's when Daddy didn't know Jesus. Ask mommy. <laughs> 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 yes, it's like SNL. Saturday Night Live. So. <laughs> okay. Any comments up to that point? Because I'll just keep flipping through the charts here. But uh, what verse was from do that first works? Where was that from? I don't remember from where out there falling. One moment, please. While I obtain the verse. Hold, please. 
that on the internet thing here? No, it's okay. just because this is such an old computer, it doesn't, is doing one too many things at once. Remember, remember. Revelation 2.5. Remember therefore from whence art fallen and repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That was the letter to Ephesus, I believe. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think this was... Yeah, under the church of Ephesus. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Yeah. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And yeah, remember, from, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Got it. And so that's... I think that's what America needs to to do. The only problem, though, is that I think a lot of the churches nowadays don't see that that is a necessary thing. They don't see repentance as necessary. They, I even remember watching TVN and they had Joel Osteen on there, and they were it wasn't it was they were just interviewing him, and the the person that was interviewing Joel. He says, what about sin? And what about, you know, what about talking about that? People get on to you about not talking about that. What do you have to say about that? He says, well, you know, people understand that, that you know, they've sinned. And that's just not my thing. I, I want to lift up people. I want to give them a positive esteem. And I thought, Jesus talked about that all the time. And if you go through scripture, I did this once in the prophetic books from Isaiah to Malachi. And I broke them down, the, uh, a lot of the prophetic utterances into two categories. One was condemnation, and the other one was consolation. The condemnation was calling to repentance, pointing out their sins, uh, telling the consequences of their sins if they did not repent. And consolation was, if you repent, here's what will happen. And I broke those down verse by verse, or actually it went almost chapter by chapter. And 75% of the time, God was, in a sense, condemning their actions, was calling to repentance. 25% of the time was consolation. So three-fourths of the time, he is calling you to repent. One-fourth of the time, he's talking about his mercy and, and uh, his gifts and his blessings and so forth. And I thought, well, if... If Jesus spent that much time on that subject, why would a preacher not spend any time whatsoever on it? That just just baffled me. So, and of course, even here in Revelation, of course, well, heck, just the very first thing that Christ said: "Repent, for the kingdom of God is at, is is at hand." And that's what God is constantly calling us to do: is to repent from our sins. And I I think that's what this has to happen in this country, but honestly, I, does anybody actually see that happening on a grand scale, on a large scale? I don't know. The last time an American president called the nation to fast and repent Lincoln. was Lincoln, 1864. It was an act of Congress. What's interesting, I, I, th I found an interesting parallel. I don't know if this is the case, but... Uh, <coughs> When Jonah preached to Nineveh, which was a Gentile city, sinful city, when he preached to him, 40 days will be destroyed. He didn't even tell them they had an option to repent. He was so ticked off at him. He hated him. But uh, he said, 40 days will be destroyed. When they repented, they were spared 150 years before their destruction finally came. 
Hezekiah, who one of the kings of Judah, I think it was the southern king of Judah, he was told he's going to he's going to die, and he prayed and cried out to the Lord, and, and the prophet Isaiah came and told him, "Okay, God has given you 15 more years." And I've often wondered, is 15 or a multiple of 15 uh, an indication of mercy or an extension of mercy? And what's interesting, it's almost been 150 years since Lincoln called this nation to repentance. And this president now says we are not a Christian nation. And I think the, the recent election just pointed that out. So I kind of wonder, do we have, are we running out of our extension of mercy? I don't know. What, what, what year would that put that in? 64, that'd be 2014, wouldn't it? Huh, that's interesting. It's interesting that the, the economic recession began in 2007, which is seven years. That's another number. Interesting. I have my license. Huh? At least I'll have my license. Yes. That's when we started admitting it. Huh? That's when we started admitting it. Admitting what? The recession. Yeah, that was when, based upon, you know, if, what what is, de I don't know what is declared to be an official recession, <coughs> but it was in December of 2007 when the numbers added up to say, yes, we're in a recession now. When they could no longer avoid it by fudging the numbers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, they fudged it. By so that was interesting to me, is the, that God gives an incredible amount of mercy. And just here and just watching in Jacob's life over 20 years, even after 20 years, he still has foreign gods among himself. He's still hanging out with some of the locals, doing some things, or at least his family shouldn't be doing. 2014, that's when Obamacare kicks in, right? I think so. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, read, uh, something real, I read something real interesting. I'm doing a uh, small group study with a college group right now. <clears throat> And it's like principles of a godly man. They started out, the first principle was on purity. And he had a real good point, because it's kind of like old-fashioned in the way that he states everything. Uh -huh. But he had a term he called legal sensuality. And he said there's a certain amount of sensuality that our culture just is just permissible. Where you can just go on TV and, you know, a girl in a bikini or in her underwear in a murder scene, it's just normal. Yeah. I and mean, people don't even look at it, it doesn't even register in their heads as being something wrong. And he said the culture has dictated this moral point, so to speak. And he said that doesn't necessarily say mean that it's right. This could be way wrong and the culture's just giving you a thumbs up on it. Because they're like, Oh, okay, we're used to this. And he said that has led to a lot of our desens desensitizing specifically in that area. And I kinda have uh, just explore, turn the idea over in my own head on like a bigger scale. And I notice <coughs> that if you look at like, uh, uh, is it uh, Jacob uh -huh. here? In that day, idols were kind of commonplace. Yeah. Now, I, we look at it now and go, dude, why are you doing that? But I mean, that was kind of a regular thing for everybody back then to have all these idols around everywhere and all these different gods. And buying into whatever your culture dictates is okay at the time does not necessarily remove you from sin. Yeah, that's and a good point. It, it, which kind of was just, it, and I, I would apply it to like different sections of life, and I'm just kind of exploring the idea in different ways. But I think that that's something that's worth a lot of thought, and it occurred to me when talking about the country too. I mean, just because you know Obama passes a new law on something that doesn't automatically make it okay. Yeah. You need to go back to the original rule book, which is the Bible, and then match stuff up, not just take whatever the culture shuffle, shovels out to you as, yeah. you know, gold. Well, since they had little statues and earrings and things that were considered, you know, uh, against the Lord, what do we have today in our culture, maybe even in our own house, that we might call foreign gods? TV. TV. I think it's a lifestyle, honestly. I think the, um, this is another thing I heard from somebody else. They said, uh, you know, for all these people want to get married, they want to have this house and this much money and this much saved up in the bank. And some of the best marriages I've ever heard of are when they have, like, you know, a full tank of gas and 50 bucks in their pocket. Yeah. You know, and somebody said, uh, 
So they said, Hawks, that'd have been good, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember that in those days. But they said, they said, somebody said, they're, that person is trying to build a lifestyle before they get married. They're not trying to get married, they're trying to build a lifestyle. Yeah. And I think that that's the biggest single issue that America faces nowadays, or at least American Christians. They're trying to, you know, they want to have their, their their latte every morning at Starbucks. They want to have the perfect president. They want to have all these different things. And you can apply it politically or anywhere across the board. I think you need to stop pursuing whatever the cultural lifestyle, whatever is hip right now. Yeah. I think that's the biggest false god is whatever the culture shovels out to you as being. It's almost right. like living up to a particular image. Yeah. That in, the in culture any area, says. Yeah. In any area. I mean, consumerism. Anywhere. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's. I think it is. That's a good point. We we all do, even though they had their gods were actually little tiny gods of wood and stone or whatever. But we still have our own little gods running around in our households that we may not be. It just we, we just be have become oblivious to them. But yeah, when we look into the true word of God, and we start to see what is what is God's absolute moral standard, then we can measure everything against that. And uh, having talked with atheists uh, about morals, from their perspective, it's all relative. It's all, and it's it's all what they govern to be moral. Of course, what's interesting is they always see themselves as being more moral than the God of the Bible. They always condemn him, saying, you know, he's awful. He's a misogynist. I don't know all the big words. <laughs> if we when we were watching. Uh, uh, What's that show called? There was a documentary called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. At the end, Ben Stein interviewed uh, Richard Dawkins. And uh, Daw Dawkins goes on and on this, you know, calling God a homophobic, misogynistic, hega, whatever. Big Just words. A, big words, long list, destroying God, implying that his morality was greater than the God of the Bible. So it's even interesting to see that somehow man has has to now look down to see God there progress you know this these men anyway so <clears throat> but uh, anyway he did have divine protection in Genesis 35 5 it said and they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob uh, I put here after what happened to Shechem they definitely needed divine protection from the tribes in the area uh, not only did God bring them safely from Shechem to Bethel, but from his initial promise at Bethel until now, which was back to Bethel. So uh, God, the promise that God made to him over 20 years ago, he completely fulfilled all the way back to where he made it back into the land. So that's neat to see. Uh, it says, he, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. Uh, it was here at Bethel, possibly well, for 30 years ago. Yeah, at this time it would have been 30 years ago because it was 20 back until he got to Sukkoth and then another 8 or 9 years or maybe 10 years. Uh, that he had nothing but that, but was promised many things and now he arrives here again with many of those promises fulfilled and gives God the praise. Because if you remember, he had nothing but basically his, clothes, his, his coat, his shoes, and a, a stick, a staff, and that was it. Uh, God provided all of that when he came back. Were you going to say something? No, you said a stick. A walking staff. Staff. And a staff. Uh, what's interesting here, though, this is, as I started to read this, I wondered, okay, Lord, why did you mention this? It says, but Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called, I don't know, Along Bak, some, some. Yeah, so, <laughs> which means the oak of weeping. Uh, in Genesis twenty four fifty nine, when Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, went to go find a bride for Isaac, it says there, and they went away, Rebekah their sister, or excuse me, and they sent away Rebekah their sister and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And some believe, some commentators say that Deborah was the nurse that came with Rebekah from Laban's house many years ago. Others say, no, that was a different servant, so they don't really know who it is. But either way, she must have meant a great deal to the family to have been mentioned here. Here is a servant to the wife 
of Isaac, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is not Rachel, this is Rebecca's uh, nurse, is being mentioned here. And many times when somebody is mentioned in the scriptures as having passed away, it's, it's a significant event, at least to be enough to be mentioned. But what's interesting though is that, why isn't Rebecca mentioned? We had Sarah, the wife of Abraham, Rachel, the wife of Isaac, and Rebecca, the, or excuse me, Rebecca, and then Rachel. So why would they mention her, but not, but not Rebecca? Why would God do that? It's like Chuck Missler says. There's every, every. There's a purpose for everything that is written in Scripture. And there was a reason here why, I'm thinking, why God didn't mention the death of Rebecca. Anybody have an idea? Let's see, Rebecca, of course, I said, was the bride of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, who was a type of Christ in Genesis 22 as a sacrifice at Mount Moriah. If you remember, in Genesis 22, Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain and offered him as a sacrifice. And it was on that mountain, of course, where God had revealed to Abraham that another son would be sacrificed on that exact same mountain. That would be Jesus Christ. So Isaac, in a sense, was a type of Christ. Well, Isaac's bride was Rebekah. Well, who's the bride of Christ? The church. So I said, could this be a picture of the church? The bride of Christ will not perish. It's just one of those things that, you know, it kind of makes you wonder. Of course, the scriptures say that all, Christ said, you know, all of the scripture pointed to him. And of course, when he said that, he was referring to the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And here we have a picture of Isaac, who was a type of Christ at the time when he was offered. And then his bride has no recording of her death whatsoever. It says of her nurse, but not of her. So I kind of wonder, is, is this a, a, a hint of something else in the scriptures? Uh, here again, here it says, uh, okay, I don't know, if, were you here when we had the discussion of, of whether the man that was wrestling with Jacob, was that really God himself? Because it's, it called him the man. The question was, well, was, was that God wrestling with him? Because it said the man, it didn't say God. But of course he named that place Peniel because... He said, I have wrestled with the Lord, and I've seen him face to face. Well, back in, uh, well, here in 35, 10, it says, And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. So again, here in this chapter we're talking about, 35, God himself is saying, I, No longer will you be called Jacob, you will be called Israel. But back in 32, when he was wrestling, it says, and he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So I think that this is a, a, a passage of scripture that you can look to if you're asking the question, was that man God himself? Was it the pre-incarnate Christ with Jacob? And I'm saying, yes, I believe it is, based upon this scripture here, because God himself gives him that name again of Israel. Um, so what do you guys think? I don't know, I just threw that out. Sounds good? Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, in Genesis 35, 11, and 12, here again we see, I think, I believe this is the third time where God reaffirms the covenant with uh, Jacob. Um, I think the first time was at Bethel. Uh, I think the other time was when he called, told him to go back to the land of Canaan, and this is the third time again. Of course, God likes to do things in threes. Uh, and God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful, multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the, seed, the land. So again, he's a, confirming the covenant. And um, I said here Jesus appears again because it says in 13, verse 13, it says, And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. What's interesting, it says, it, the implication in the text here is that God was actually standing there talking to him and then was lifted up away from him. 
So again, I think this is another indication that that first time that he was wrestling with the man, that was Christ himself. And of course, he changed his name at that time and then touched his side. So after he had his, ex had his experience with Christ, he walked differently from then on, which I think is another interesting piece. Uh, but I think this is another indication that here again, God appeared unto him in, in the form of Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, reconfirming the covenant in the exact same place where Jacob had the, the dream of the angels descending, ascending and descending on the ladder. And I think uh, I brought it up, I don't have it here, but there's the scripture where Christ talked about, uh, for you shall see the son of the angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. So I think, again, that's another picture of Christ. So, anyway. So if anybody says, well, Jesus showed up in the New Testament, he wasn't at all in the Old Testament, I think they don't know their scriptures. I think it's very clear, just even in the first book, that Christ was all over that place. He owned it. <laughs> he showed up. Uh, so anyway, I already said that I believe it was Christ wrestling with them. Um, here's another little interesting fact before we send you away. Uh, of course, mentioning Rachel's death, uh, as she was dying, she named her last son ben Benoni, which means son of, of my sorrow. Benjamin, however, was his name as by the father, which means son of the right hand. Uh, it says, and Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephra, Ephrath, which is Bethlehem, hence called Bethlehem Ephratha. If you remember when, uh, was it Herod who diligently sought the timing of Christ's birth and where he would be born, they said, where would he be born? And they turned to Micah 5.2, and he said he should be born in, er, in Bethlehem Ephratha. Because technically there was actually two Bethlehems. And this was the lower Bethlehem, which is Bethlehem Ephrathah. Uh, and of course, it also matches with Matthew 2.18. It says, Rachel weeping for her children, because this is the same place where Rachel died, which is the same place where Jesus was born, in Bethlehem. And of course, Bethlehem means house of bread. Of course, Jesus was known as the bread of life. He was known as the manna. And also in Bethlehem, that was the town where the priests would raise the sacrificial lamb that was sacrificed once a year for the sins of the whole nation, which is interesting. Christ was born in the same place who is our Passover lamb. So, but I see, notice the hidden prophetic meaning of the names and locations. Uh, Jesus said in John 16, 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, sorrowful, I can't talk, sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Soon after Rachel named him son of sorrow, his name was immediately changed to son of the right hand. And of course, Benjamin was born in Bethlehem. <coughs> so I think it's interesting that he was accounted unto sorrow, and he was seen, and there was sorrow for, sorrowful for him, but soon after, three days later, he became the son of the right hand. So, in a sense, Benjamin himself is also a type of Christ. He went from being the man of sorrow to the man who stood on the right hand of God in his name and born in the same place where Christ was born. That's cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that one. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. And then he goes on. I said, ooh. Who's Reuben? Is that a dude? It's a sandwich. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, of course here, Jacob just lost his beloved wife, Rachel, now his firstborn son, which is Reuben, defiles the handmaid of Rachel, which is Bilhah. So I say, ooh, thick. Is Bilhah... Uh, those, those are good lists there. Yeah. Now, I don't know why this is mentioned in Scripture. It's, it's just kind of like mentioned in passing. Has anybody ever, as you read that, did you, anything come to mind that you can think of elsewhere in Scripture? Why, why would God mention this brief little thing? I thought the significance was that 
was the fact that Jacob now had 12 sons. I thought that was the significance. They were simply explaining where they came from for genealogical purposes. The, so you're saying that... The significance of the story is not the method, means, or sin by which the child was born. To me, the significance of the story was that now the sons of Jacob... Are you talking 12. about this verse or about Benjamin being born? Because it doesn't mention any children being born from this. It just says that Reuben... Okay, well, I got the two mixed up then. Oh, okay. Because okay. I'm... Okay. Yeah, Benjamin was the I'm son of... I'm talking about Benjamin, who, who had his name changed as, as soon as he was... Oh, no, no. Okay. I was wondering the significance of this verse. Why, why did God stick that little piece in there? Because... Yeah, Benjamin was the son of Rachel, and she right, just passed right, away. She just died. But this, all of a sudden, it says Reuben laid with Bel Belhaz, and then then it says, and then there were twelve. <laughs> I don't have an answer for it. I, that's why I suck up there. Ooh, sick. I mean, because that that seems a little odd to me. But all Scripture has a purpose and a significance. I just don't know what this one is. Is Bilhah a girl name? Yeah. Oh, okay. I get it now. Yeah. And then, of course, we hear that we see the list of the sons and. Uh, Israel comes to his father in Hebron. Isaac dies at the age of 180, and uh, Israel and Esau bury their father there. And then we'll find out in the next chapter uh, that Jacob and Esau were actually together after this, and they eventually had to separate because their flocks and their herds and their families had gotten too large. So that whole incident that happened 30, 40, however many years ago, actually, how old was Jacob when when the brothers fought and the two left. I can't remember the age. Does anybody remember their age? Because quite a bit of time has passed mm -hmm. since this that event. <coughs> maybe it was, maybe it was, he was 140 or 130. I listened to it twice this morning and I don't remember it being in there. I, don't I kept thinking it was mentioned back there. But either way, the family has now been reconciled. The brothers have now been reconciled. But it took, Lord... 30, 40, 50 years for it to happen. But, uh, of course, this is, of course, how all the 12 tribes came together. And, and then now we'll get into the next chapter. We'll go through really quick, maybe even just breeze through, because it talks a lot about uh, Esau and his descendants. But I think that chapter is significant because he, too, was given a promise that he would have many descendants. Of course, many of them are named Duke. Duke this, Duke that. It was it? I don't know what a duke is in scripture. I have to look that up. But, but the promise that was also talked to, that was given to Esau is, it bears witness in the next chapter that he had many descendants. So, and one of them turned out to be John Wayne. <laughs> yeah, the duke. The duke. Uh. Exactly. And that's why we have Western movies because of Esau. In in the in the pottage. That was his trip. The red pottage. Is that the right word? Pottage? That doesn't sound right. Porridge? Anyway. Well, that's the end for that chapter. <laughs> Any questions? We're going to prove six next week, right? Yeah, we'll, it'll probably be 36, 37, because 36 is a genealogy of Esau. PJ can read that one. <laughs> and so yeah. the story of Joseph, so it'll be in color next time? <laughs> Take the color green cup. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go from black and white to color. It's like the Wizard of Oz. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Yellow Road. It leads oh. to Egypt. Munchkins everywhere and <laughs> So. Oh, it's kind of a somber mood tonight, isn't it? Everybody's kind of quiet. Okay. Well, let's close out in prayer and then. Uh, we can, who would who like to close this out sir? Any volunteers? Just willing to jump up so quickly. I'll close this out there. <laughs> Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much for bringing us together to study in your word. And uh, Lord, what I find fascinating is even in the parts that uh, seem insignificant and seem uh, trite, Lord, there is so much depth into it uh, that uh, Jesus Christ was telling the truth when he said that uh, all of Scripture speaks of him. And Lord, thank you for letting us see that and help us to, to plant that in our hearts to know that uh, you had a plan from the very beginning, all the way back to the beginning of creation, Lord, to, to bring your son Jesus Christ to this earth to die in our place. 
And Lord, uh, I pray that you'd be with our nation now, and I pray that repentance would sweep across this nation. Obviously, it has to start at the house of God. So Lord, I pray that you would, and it has to start with the individual. So Lord, if there's any sin on our hearts, I pray that you would point that out to us and uh, help us to come to a place of repentance if we're not in that place, because it has to start with us, Lord, if we're going to see it sweep across this nation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. End of the show.